in collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Coming up this week, much of the focus is on energy. We ask, what should we do with our natural gas? The first step should be to um, transform the power sector here, to get rid of the diesel and so on, and use your own natural gas. The University of Cyprus is collaborating on a project looking at energy rehabilitation in public buildings. If you're a producer and then you can sell electricity to the neighbour in a peer-to-peer scheme, yes, these are all evolving, these are new concepts now. And we find out about a new mini-book on innovation. Simplify the definition and go for a very simple and generic definition. It is something new and useful. It can be very new or simply new to the organisation in question. On Tuesday in Nicosia, there was a conference organised by the Cyprus Economic Society entitled Global Energy and the Eastern Mediterranean. One of the keynote speakers was Nick Butler. He's an international authority on global energy and was talking about the changing global energy market and the issues it raises for the East Med. He joins us now. Nick There are a lot of issues. I'm wondering where you started when you gave your talk, and then we can perhaps talk about the reaction from the audience. Uh, Where I started was the things that have happened over the last few years since uh, gas was first discovered in the eastern Mediterranean. And I remember coming then and the high hopes that there were for the benefits that that would bring. Then I went on to talk about what's happened in the world market, uh, what I think is going to happen next in the world market, and coming back to uh, what the consequences might be for Cyprus and the gas here. We've talked on the programme many times, actually, including with your fellow speaker, Charles Elinas, about the situation in the East Med, and it does seem from the things he's been telling me over the years that the chances of us actually getting the gas out and being able to sell it are diminishing. Uh, Well, I agree with that in one way. I think the assumption over the last 10 years has been that the gas would be exported to one of the main markets of the world, to Europe or possibly even to Asia. And many people have tried to find a route to do that, either by liquefying it, an LNG plant here or somewhere else, uh, pipelines uh, through Turkey or through some other route, and none of those routes have materialised. But I do think, actually, and this was the positive side of my message on Tuesday, that there is a market for the gas in this region. And I think that this region needs energy. And I think Cyprus, if either by selling the natural gas directly or, I think more potentially, uh, turning it into electricity, and selling that electricity to different countries in the region uh, would be of great benefit uh, to areas that need power and also of great benefit to the economy here because if you're converting gas into electricity that creates the need for infrastructure, for new plants and for jobs. It's interesting, isn't it, because we talk about profits to be made from selling, but in actual fact, if we became self-sufficient, even for our own electricity supply, because we're still not positive how much gas is down there, are we? Whether or not that would be the better option than trying to export it, and it seems that Asia is probably the most likely market, and that will make it terribly expensive because you've got to get it there. I don't think Asia is the most likely market. Uh, I think there are plenty of alternatives for countries like India, which are going to need more energy. But I think they're going to keep using coal because it employs a lot of people. It's uh, indigenous. They don't have to pay for the imports. uh, And it employs hundreds of thousands of people. And I don't think that's going to be displaced. They will need that. And they have rapidly growing supplies of renewables, of wind and solar, which are much cheaper now. That's the big change over the last few years. And all the forecasts, and I showed when I spoke 
uh, some of the forecasts show a very limited amount of natural gas being used in a country like India and it, it will be very competitive to get into that market. There are many suppliers, Qatar, East Africa, uh, Australia, Indonesia, who are closer to the Indian and the Asian market and it's a long way from the Eastern Mediterranean. So and what would we do with ours? Well, I go back to where it. you were. I think you, the first step should be to um, transform the power sector here to get rid of the diesel and so on and use your own natural gas. And, and renewables, uh, because we're and, and way behind in Cyprus yeah, yes, on renewables and we've just had a bit of a rap on the knuckles from the EU yes, for setting targets far too low. Yeah. And how do you put the renewables into the fossil fuel gas mix? Right. Well, I think uh, either would be an improvement on the energy mix that you have now. I think it is perfectly possible to do both, uh, but I think there's far more gas than you need here, particularly if you do it alongside renewables, which would be a great thing. And therefore, I'd look for export markets, and I think there are export markets for electricity around the region. In a, in a different world, there'd be a single electricity grid across the Middle East. It's much needed. But politics stands in the way of that. There are too many conflicts. That's not going to happen. But I think Cyprus has an ideal position of relationships with many people in the region and could supply the electricity directly from here, bilaterally. And I think that that is how the value is going to be realised. I don't think it's going can win export markets in Europe or India. The elephant in the room, of course, is Turkey. Can we talk a little bit about what's happening with their drilling? Do you feel that they're really looking for gas, or is this very much a sort of political standoff? Uh, I think they're doing both, uh, but it's surprising to me that they're not looking in waters that are uncontested, i.e. their own territorial waters. The geologist's view is that the whole province, right up the Levant coast from Egypt, past Gaza, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Cyprus and Turkey offshore, has high potential. Indeed, even across to Greece with the drilling that's, I think, going to start in Crete quite soon. Uh, the geologist view of the region has changed with the discoveries that have been made and I think there's much more to be found and the challenge is how you use it. Uh, Turkey will have to speak for itself on why it's challenging uh, territorial waters here. I think the dispute is long running. Uh, it's beyond uh, anybody from Britain to comment on or tell other people what to do. And what about the impact of Egypt's find in Zor? Well, because that's had a game-changing yes. effect, I think, on the whole energy picture in the region. Yes, that's a great find, and it will help supply Egypt, which needs gas and electricity. I think that, too, will mainly be used in this region rather than being exported. Uh, but Yes, it confirms the view taken 10, 15 years ago by the US geologists who looked at the whole region and said that this had great potential. And that, plus the field off Israel, Leviathan, uh, uh, plus the smaller finds here, all suggest this is uh, a very significant province. And I would hope that it helps to improve the economy across the region because uh, having resources like that can be very good if you use them well. And that's the bottom line, isn't it? Not only the politics, but people getting together across state lines, as it were, in order to cooperate. I mean, Lebanon is presumably also sitting on potentially big fines. It's all in that same area. They haven't started they exploring yet, but I, I was in Lebanon 18 months ago, and they're certainly very hopeful, and are about to, I think, go into a licensing round. So what effect will that have? Because they're already in the region. We, of course, as an island, have to get it across the sea to wherever it's going, yes. unless we use it, as you say, in Cyprus. Well, but I then it's I, too much of it. I think I'd start by using it in Cyprus. That's 
a good project that will take a little time, that's step one. Then I think if you produce sufficient power, there are still countries across the region, and I go as far as North Africa, which need power and which don't have it. And I think uh, Cyprus is just ideally placed as a hub with good relationships, uh, good infrastructure here, and uh, people are willing to invest because Cyprus is part of the EU and trustworthy. And I think that's all great potential. Nick Butler, visiting professor and chair of the King's Policy Institute at King's College London, who was in Cyprus earlier this week, to give a talk on the changing global energy market and the issues it raises for the East Med at a conference organised by the Cyprus Economic Society. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambis. A new project has been launched to support innovative and cost-effective energy rehabilitation in public buildings. It's a project that's coordinated by the FOSS Research Centre for Sustainable Energy at the University of Cyprus. And the project coordinator joins us now. He is Professor Yorgos Yorgiou. Yorgos, tell us first of all about the whole idea behind this project, because you have, I think partners in several other Mediterranean countries. Yeah, so this is a project that is a collaboration between the University of Cyprus, the University of Cagliari in Italy, the University of Western Macedonia in Greece, and uh, Ben Gurion University in Israel, and the uh, municipalities of Eilat and Eilat. And uh, this project is funded by the Mediterranean program, the ENI, which is a European uh, initiative. And uh, the whole idea behind what we have been trying to do is to try to develop and increase the penetration of photovoltaics by using battery storage, but at the same time rendering the, the whole building into a nanoscript um, system. Now, that that's what I wanted to ask you about, because I read about these nanogrids and microgrids. For the uninitiated like me, what are we talking about here? In the case of a nanogrid, we can be talking about a building that can have production, can have energy storage, so the production could be the photovoltaics, battery storage to store the energy, consumption, the building inhabitants, and at the same time you do an uh, intelligent management of the load and the production, and can, you can also be disconnected from the grid if you wish so. If you go to a bigger scale, then you're talking about a microgrid. So in our case, we want to take the nanogrid and we consider as our nanogrid one building. In the case of Israel, it's a school. In the case of uh, Greece, it could be a, a building in the university campus. The same will happen here in Cyprus. And in this way, we can have a smart management of uh, our loads, our production, the battery storage, uh, so that we can enable further penetration of the technology. Right, when we say a grid, again I'm not familiar with the whole system, but when you talk about the electricity grid for example, it's serving lots and lots of people. So could the grids in these houses once they have been, or these buildings once they've been rehabilitated, also serve surrounding buildings? If you saw what I mean, do you get then a cluster of like a mini power station? Absolutely, that's the whole idea. We are moving towards microgrids, we are moving towards distributed generation. We have the main grid that can be used to provide us with electricity, but at the same time, right now, we are producing with photovoltaics, let's say, so we can become s s uh, small nodes that can produce electricity. Not and just for your own use, but also for absolute, the surrounding absolutely. buildings. Absolutely, but uh, to start with, yes, to start with, you can start by the increasing your self-consumption, and then, of course, there will be flow of energy, if you wish so, to other surrounding uh, buildings as well. But predominantly, you want to do it for your own uh, needs. Can this be rolled out for other applications? Once you've got the system in place, because this is a research project after all, you've got to see if it's going to work and how it works and whether or not even climatic conditions could make a difference to its efficiency, I imagine. So once you've got that information, 
Could you roll it out, let's say, to every school in Cyprus? Yeah, this is this is what the the future, the way things will be operating in the future, will be very different. Up to now, we know of a one directional um, flow of energy from the power stations to the consumers. Or things if you changing. sorry, hang on yeah. a second. Or for the few people who did put photovoltaics on their homes, then they're pretty well self sufficient. And I'm not sure what happened with selling some excess back to the electricity authority grid. I don't know if that's still happening exactly. or not. But, but if you had that in whole neighbourhoods, you wouldn't actually need a central electricity authority, would you? You, you would still need the, the network, the electricity grid, because it's like the motorway. You might have houses all around uh, Cyprus, but you need a motorway, you need the roads to be able to be uh, to have the main flow. So I strongly believe that you will have an electricity grid in the future. However, because your production now is distributed, you can maximize the benefits of having distributed generation by consuming and producing in the same vicinity. In order to be able to do that, you have to have your storage and you have to match your electricity with your demand. But of course, if you have excess electricity in one building, there's nothing stopping you from potentially selling your electricity to the next building, if you see what I mean. But right now we are focusing on making that building or the nano grid or the micro grid into a smart system that can have a more effective operation that can utilize the renewable energy sources, the battery storage, to have the energy management system and to have the possibility to disconnect from the grid or to still be connected to the grid. Battery efficiency has been one of the things I think up till now that's held back a lot of this sort of technology, but things have improved, am I right in thinking, in yes. the last couple of years, so that now the batteries can store much more electricity, but we still have the problem, do we not, of, let's say, the surges of when electricity is being made, and then the surges when it's not, but the demand is great. That balance if I remember the last time I spoke about this, was something that was potentially inefficient and possibly damaging to the whole grid system. Yeah, um, battery prices are a limiting factor and they have been going down over the years. Battery prices are still not competitive in a lot of applications. You can see some of the applications for ancillary services that can potentially be beneficial. You see in the UK and Germany some applications for ancillary services. So we are seeing a, a, a very fast decline in the prices. So that's one point. Coupled this with the low electricity prices from uh, photovoltaics, and slowly, slowly you will see a change in the way things are operating. And this is why the battery storage is something that will enable the operation of nanogrids, of microgrids, you will see changes in the way that you interact also the consumers or the prosumers interact with the, the rest of the uh, parts of the system. So you will see a lot of changes in the future and at the center you will see the so-called prosumer. So the people who are consumers and are also producers at the same time. So perhaps you, you will have your PV system, you will have your load, you will be consuming loads. So you will be able to be an active participant in this whole endeavour. A lot of the buildings that this might be fitted to are not new buildings necessarily. How difficult is it to retrofit when you're talking about older architecture that didn't have these sort of possibilities in mind? Is it more expensive? Is it still efficient? I'm, to be honest with you, you have to, the constituent parts of um, a nanogrid are the production, photovoltaics, let's say, the battery, so you can uh, install the battery, and then you have the controller, so you have to be able to monitor your load, and you want to have also a software that can manage all that. So I guess it's much more difficult to do it with an old building, but there's nothing stopping you from uh, having this concept uh, in a retrofitted way. And of course, I assume that more newly constructed buildings, they're Energy efficiency is built in these days, isn't it, according Absolutely. to EU legislation. Absolutely. So their demand for power is okay. presumably less. Well, exactly. And that will mean that in the future, 
there'll be an excess of power being generated. Yeah, or the way that uh, things are moving, you will only produce as much as you need. So if your energy demand is lower, there's no need to produce more energy. So uh, I, I would say that first of all, mix, minimize your demand, your energy demand, and then produce as much electricity as you need to cover your demand. But doesn't that sort of nullify the whole idea of having grid systems dotted all over the place where people who aren't actually producing, just consuming, can consume yours and presumably that gives you a little bit of a profit to maintain your equipment? Yes, that's a, that's a very big question, you've, a very big topic you've raised because this is, these are the, this are, all these financial models are only evolving now because it's a new concept so nobody knows what the optimum way of moving forward is but obviously one way forward could be that if you're a producer and then you can sell electricity to the neighbor in a in a peer-to-peer -peer, um, scheme yes these are all evolving these are new concepts now which haven't been around uh, the last few years because it's something really new it could revolutionise our use and our view of how we manage our power and, of course, it will reduce emissions, one takes it. That's the end goal and uh, global warming and uh, this is the end goal. It's so important to alleviate all that. How long is the project going to last? When will you get the results and be able to say this is what everybody needs to do? Oh yeah, you're stressing me now. <laughs> we have to install the systems in the first 12 months and the project is going to run for three years. So after the 12 months we have to start collecting data and try to influence the policy and look at um, all the different barriers and uh, how to move forward. And of course to engage with them, with the public because they are an important part of the equation. And that is Professor Yorgos Yuriu, who is the project coordinator of the FOSS Research Centre for Sustainable Energy at the University of Cyprus and their new project supporting innovative and cost-effective energy rehabilitation in public buildings. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. A mini-book entitled The Heart of Innovation, Managing Apparent Paradoxes, has recently been published by Demis Mikhailidis. He is an author and a consultant on leadership, creativity and innovation. He joins us now. Dimi, what is the book about and who is it aimed at? Uh, the book is aimed at a business audience, um, people who work for organizations and people people who are leaders in some way, um, either at a high level or at a lower a low level in organizations, and who are interested in innovation in their own organization. When we say innovation, are we talking about just simply a different approach, for example, to management? Or are we talking about bringing in, I mean, innovation these days, it's always teamed up with research and innovation. Mm -hmm. And so we need to perhaps separate the two when it comes to people skills, do we? Well, innovation um, means a lot of things to different people. If you ask an academic, you'll say it's all about research. If you ask uh, uh, an entrepreneur, she will say it's all about starting a new company. If you ask a technologist, it's all about new tech. So it's a lot of things. But in I, terms of I this want, book, yeah, what well, is I want it? to simplify the definition and go for a very simple and generic definition. It is something new and useful. It can be very new or simply new to the organization in question. It can be um, very useful and very different. It can be something like uh, Google, which is really breakthrough, or it can simply be a new changed and improved process. So there's a wide range of things that make this thing we call innovation. And if you have innovation in an organization's structure mm -hmm. and an acceptance that 
innovation is good because a lot of people don't like change per se mm -hmm. finished with it yeah. and innovation presumably is change yes so that's quite a difficult thing to overcome but if you do have that acceptance what difference does it make to the company well you've nailed it uh, Rosie um, it makes a huge difference to the company if people are simply obstacles to innovation then it just won't happen or it will happen more slowly or, or it won't happen well. If people are open to change, if they embrace change to use fashionable language, then innovation and the change that comes with it is much easier, much smoother and much faster and in the end more profitable for the organization. What are the paradoxes that you talk about in the title? Managing apparent paradoxes, it presumably means again that the way we look at things affects how we do them. Yes, it does. Organizations have to live with certain paradoxes. They are things that are both useful but can in many ways be also contradictory. The four paradoxes that I analyze in this book, which I believe are important for innovation, are first top-down and bottom-up. Top-down means there has to be an innovation strategy that is thought out usually at the top of an, of an organization, but if it's more participative, that's better. But leaders also have to mobilize the creativity of their people and get ideas coming bottom up. You should be doing both if you want to really liberate the creative forces of the organization, again, to use fashionable language. The second paradox is individuals and teams. Teamwork collaboration is crucial, it's imperative, it has to happen in organizations, but we mustn't forget that great ideas come from individuals who also work alone. So in an organization we have to figure out how to bring out those collaborative powers, but at the same time allow and encourage individuals to bring out their best ideas by themselves and a lot of people will not bring out their best ideas in a group. On the other hand, no innovation is possible without collaboration. It just never happens. The third one is change and continuity. You mentioned change before. There is no innovation without change. We all love change and hate change. So the pace of change every one of us can accept once is different. The problem is that today it has to be faster rather than slower if we compare with any other time in the history of business, in the history of mankind. We also need to have periods of continuity. These are not periods of being um, static or stagnant. These are periods where we're consolidating our previous innovations, thinking about the new ones. But the changes must also be continuous in a sense. Yes. When you talk about the continuity, that must carry on regardless of the changes. They must fit into the continuity, for example, mm -hmm. of the ethos of a company. Yes, yes. Some things should change less frequently, and that's values and ethos, as you say. But it is a paradox managing the speed of change, if you like. And the last one is imagination and reason. And we're used to thinking about organizations in terms of reason, because we've been to business schools, because we're chartered accountants, because we're lawyers, and we have degrees that teach us how to think logically. However, the most really good and way out ideas do not have their origins in logical thinking. Einstein discovered relativity when he imagined he was traveling on a beam of light. He was not doing equations or reading books. He did that afterwards to prove his theory. But the key ideas came from strange pictures in his mind. So, does that mean we should go to work tomorrow and start exchanging our fantasies and uh, our imaginative ideas? I think yes. I think we have to give time for that as well. We do need reason, because in the end, our ideas have to be grounded and implemented. Otherwise, they're not creative ideas. They're uh, fantasies, they're imagination. Nice things maybe, but I don't call that innovation. So it can't be applied, basically, as well. Yes, it has to be, in the end, applied. But beforehand, the idea might come from something which is pretty irrational. In the end, it has to be rational. So you've got those paradoxes. The book, I presume, is telling you how to 
put all of what you've said into practice, is there any difference according to what sort of business it is? Yes, I think all organizations have these paradoxes and all leaders have to manage them within their organization. And it's not to choose between teams and individuals, it's to find the right balances. Of course, some things are more important for some organizations than they are for others. People in a publicity agency will give rein to imagination more easily than they will in a manufacturing operation, for example. But it doesn't mean that imagination is not important in manufacturing, quite to the contrary. So there are different cultures, there are different ways of working according to industry, according to context, according to the legacy and history of um, the organization. But leadership can go quite a long way in shaping the direction of these things. So where's the book available? The book is available online. The simplest is to go on Kindle. So you can't get a hard copy, but there are electronic ones, better for the trees, of course. Right. If you don't have a Kindle, other options? Um, there's um, Kobo books and a number of other, I forget the exact name of them, but all you have to do is look at The Heart of Innovation, Managing Apparent Paradoxes, and put in my name, Dimis Michalides, as the author, and you will get it for a very modest price, I must say. Yeah, something like a euro, I think. But if yeah. you do that, then you can download it, or do you have to yes. have an app or something in order to be able to read it? Um, you can download it. You might have to also download a free app. The Ms. Michaelides, author of the mini-book The Heart of Innovation, Managing Apparent Paradoxes. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.